Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. We have presumptive Green Party nominee for President Howie Hawkins on. Talk to him about that race. We also have an economist on who is making the case for a federal jobs guarantee. But there are some pretty significant races on the ballot today, especially in Kentucky and New York that progressives have a close eye on. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start, I guess, with Kentucky, something that we've talked a lot here. This is from The Hill. Left eye is a huge night in New York and Kentucky primaries. And Kentucky primary in particular, we We've seen the, resur the surge, basically, of Charles Booker, who is a progressive challenger, to Amy McGrath. And so Booker, as the progressive challenger, was kind of seen as a long-shot candidate maybe not that long ago, Yeah. bolstered by the Black Lives Matter movement and also really by Amy McGrath's own deficiencies as a candidate. She's had a couple of big problems recently in the state. I mean, in that debate with uh, Charles, I th first she stood by, right, calling herself a pro-Trump Democrat. And then she also had a mixed explanations for why she hadn't attended the protests in the first place. Yeah. And all of this matters because this is an open primary seat in which the, D uh, the, the Chuck Schumer and the Democratic Senate Committee pit hand-picked her as the candidate and have poured literally millions of dollars into her campaign yeah. offers. And yet the Kentucky Democratic establishment even is pushing back largely going with Charles here. So it's going to be a, a very interesting night down in Kentucky. Obviously, I've been watching this one really closely, and I've known Charles for a while. He's the youngest African-American lawmaker in the state. He's a state representative. Um, he's really been running this populist campaign connecting, mm -hmm. you know, some of the poverty in Appalachia with some of the poverty he grew up in within Louisville. And, um, you know, he has a, a final ad out that I think really makes the case for his campaign pretty powerfully. Let's take a look at that. He never saw us coming. He never saw those medical bills pile up. He never asked what we needed. He spent trillions of dollars bailing out his friends while we lined up for unemployment. He let the government abandon America. Bad in Kentucky. I explained to you how these types of laws would kill people. My life matters too, Speaker. You are out of order. My Your three minutes are up. He so that's Charles, and his tagline has been from the hood to the holler. Um, polls show him, recent poll has him up on McGrath. This in spite of, like you said, right. she has raised tens of millions of dollars. He has been dramatically outsped, and he has picked up steam here fundraising down the stretch, but that is not going to change the fact that he has been dramatically outspent by the millions that have poured in from across the country. I think the numbers I saw, McGrath has raised something like 96% mm -hmm. of her money from out of state. Booker's been endorsed by Sanders, by AOC, um, by Elizabeth Warren. He's gotten a lot of the national progressives, but as you rightly point out, he also has a lot of local Kentucky state official support. So a lot of his fellow legislators backed him, Allison Lundrick and Grimes, who is a big name in terms of the establishment in Kentucky, also backed him, Matt Jones, who's a popular sports radio host, threw in behind him as well. So one of the big questions here is, and, and Amy McGrath for her part, I mean, she's very sort of consultant-driven candidate, yes, right, really right. tries to stay on the talking points from the consultants. She stumbled out of the gates. She got asked a very obvious question. You're going right. to be running yeah. against Mitch McConnell. So, of course, number one question, how would you have voted on Kavanaugh? She didn't know. She was here. Then she was there. She was all over the place. It didn't make sense. She's positioned herself as, I'm going to be more pro-Trump than Mitch McConnell is, which is sort of ridiculous. Very high unfavorables. And so not only is she losing to Charles, according to the polls, in this primary, um, but she also has very high unfavorables and was polling worse than Charles, also head-to-head -head against Mitch McConnell. So he has a great case that not only is he the more exciting candidate with some clear values people can get behind, like you said, buoyed by this protest movement, his ability to speak to that from a place of passion and conviction, but also he's got a great case to make that he's the electability candidate here as well. So for people who just want to beat Mitch McConnell, a lot of support falling behind him well, right now, too. Well, it was even more interesting in that data for progress poll. He actually was doing better than Amy McGrath in the head-to-head -head polls against Mitch McConnell. Exactly right. He was right. doing by 5% more. Now, I mean, And he had the highest favorables <laughs> of either Amy or Mitch McConnell. They were both uh, very, pretty far underwater in terms of their favorability ratings, especially McGrath. And right. Booker had an above-water approval rating. So, um, you know, another encouraging sign for him. It, it'll be interesting. I mean, I, I think one of the things that you had cautioned is both about 
There's a voting problem, as I understand it, due to the coronavirus pandemic. We can throw some of that up there on the screen. There's not going to be limited polling places available in the city of Louisville, which I think is a large Democratic stronghold in that uh, in that city and in, within the state. And it also just raises larger questions about voting in the middle of the pandemic and also as you said in the past, I think that Amy McGrath has banked a lot of mail-in ballots because she's been out there with kind of a get-out-the-vote campaign for so long. And so much money to fund that. And so much yeah. money. And when they talk about record, when they talk about record voting, I think a lot of that is mail-in ballots. So it's very possible that even if Charles saw a surge in the last week or two, that it very much could also see um, Amy McGrath just win based on mail-in ballots alone. Yeah. So the voter suppression story in Kentucky is kind of complicated. I mean, there's a Democratic governor, there is a Republican secretary of state. They have dramatically pared back the amount of day of in-person voting polling places, including Louisville, which has about half of the African-American population in the entire state lives in Louisville, has one polling place day of. Mm. Lexington, um, another, you know, the next largest city, another Democratic stronghold with a large population center, one voting place. So on the other, so obviously concerns there and um, the, you know, voting locations across the state dramatically pared back. On the other hand, they did take steps in advance to make sure that people could mail in absentee ballots so that you wouldn't have as much of a crush of people mm -hmm. on election day. So that's why they're saying that, you know, they're on track for record turnout, even with those limitations in voting. But I still think it's deeply concerning to have that few of polling places available on election day. So we'll just cross our fingers and hope that a lot of people got those mail-in ballots in early. It's just a tough situation. I mean, we covered here. Remember all those poll workers who got coronavirus in Florida and Michigan yes. and Ohio? I mean, it was yes. terrible. So, like, everybody, is, it's just a tough, it's a tough, and many of these poll workers, they're elderly, yeah. volunteers. Well, and that is part of yeah. what they said is they were really struggling to have enough poll workers. Um, and the polling locations they have, it's not like in some little church. They're at, you know, the fairgrounds, mm. the expo center. The, I think the one in Lexington is at the stadium there or the arena there. So they are large locations, but they're also, for a lot of people, hard to get to. Yeah, that's right. So if you that's haven't made those true. plans in advance, it could be a problem. Certainly. Um, another big race that we've been following here uh, that's going to unfold today is Jamal Bowman trying to unseat incumbent Elliot Engel. Um, this is a big one. Some people are calling him potentially the next AOC. He has really picked up steam both on his own merits and because of the energy around the protest movement. And though, critically, because of Elliot Engel's many faults and flaws <laughs> here down the stretch, it sort of started when, you recall with AOC and Joe Crowley, the reason she was able to pull that off is because there was a sense that he was out of touch with the district, right. right? It's this very diverse district. Here he is, this like old white guy, and he's not there, and he seems like he's more focused on what's going on here in D.C. than in his own hometown. Similar dynamic here, where first Elliot Engel gets caught lying about how much he's in the district by a reporter who was asking him, like, are you quarantining in D.C.? Are you quarantining in the district? He tried to say it was both. Turns out he hadn't been back to the district in quite some time. Then he gets caught on a hot mic um, at the, one of the protests saying he only right. cares about speaking because he's got a primary. Not it's a crazy. great thing. Yeah. Not a great thing to say. He also made some weird comments about AOC because she endorsed Jamal Bowman being a dictator or something like that. Hasn't been a great look for him down the stretch. Yeah, the whole thing is just crazy because he is, I mean, he, the dictator lying about being in the district and also just how much the establishment has gone in for Angle. So yes. as we cover here, the Congressional Black Caucus is going all in for Angle, giving, you know, trying to fundraise and endorsing him and all that for Angle against Jamal Bowman, who is his opponent. And I think it's just very much, it could be very much a similar Joe Crowley case. We have some polling actually out of the district. Let's throw that up there on the screen, the Data for Progress poll. Again, not looking good for Elliot Engel, with Jamal Bowman at 41%, Elliot Engel at 31%. But the critical point is tw not sure at 27%. Right. And generally, I think in my experience, the 27%, the not sures, they break to the establishment barring any like crazy developments in the campaign. We haven't seen anything like that. And 
when you're somebody like Elliot Engel, he's got a lot of money. Hillary Clinton, right, jumped into the race for him. Yeah, um, was for her him. first endorsement. So, I mean, all this she money this and the ability to have policy. infrastructure get out the vote, it generally tends to trend in the establishment favor, but we just have, we don't really know what's going to happen in this particular case, which is why it's such a nail-biter. Yeah, I mean, Schumer and Cuomo both jumped Everybody. off this. Everybody jumped in. CBC. I mean, and that is one of the things that's really interesting, too, is if you dig into the crosstabs on that poll, um, we've been told all these things about how African Americans line up behind the establishment candidate, how they tend to be more mm. centrist, more moderate. Uh, Jamal Bowman, who's a, an educator, former middle school principal, has been very outspoken in terms of Green New Deal, in terms of Medicare for all, the sort of Bernie Sanders platform. And yet, I think it was only 10 percent of African American voters in the district were backing Elliot Engel, the incumbent. Wow. They were overwhelmingly going for Jamal Bowman. Because again, here's someone who is of the district, who was mm -hmm. in the district, who was there on the ground, who is speaking clearly about the concerns that are in their lives. And so, yeah, it is a nail biter. And if this, if Elliot Engel gets taken out, look, this is bigger significance because you saw how even just AOC being able to take out Joe Crowley instilled some fear in the Democrats in this town. It did. Yeah. And so this is what the Tea Party was able to do. It wasn't just that they were able to elect members. They were able to terrify the people here about getting potentially primary. That's right. And so if you have another one of these dynamics here today, taking out an incumbent, that starts to make people in this town get nervous and have to think very much about how they're positioning themselves and cynically move to the left, which, again, we've talked about, like, I don't care why they're doing mm -hmm. it. But if the cynical move is to move to the left, that is a, a very important development. The other race uh, in New York that I've been following, this is an open seat, uh, Nita Lowy uh, stepped down. And so we have a, a pretty wide open primary here. And the candidate that progressives have sort of lined up behind is Mondaire Jones, um, who is an attorney. This is an interesting one. We covered it a little bit because there's this other woman in the race, Evelyn, Evelyn Farkas, mm -hmm. who oh, I covered her. was yeah. a former, <laughs> former uh, Defense Department official endorsed by John Negroponte of the Bush administration. Yes, right. Those are the types of people who are falling in line behind her. She's got a lot of like military industrial complex money behind mm -hmm. her. And she, by the way, lied on MSNBC. Right. right. And she's become weirdly like a sort of resistance hero yes. for lying on MSNBC, <laughs> saying that there was more there to the Russia story that she couldn't divulge publicly, essentially. But then when she was under oath here testifying, she admitted that that was not actually like, true. Had she no had made that up. Somehow she raised money off of that, like, oh, the bad Republicans are coming for me for speaking the truth about Trump. So you've got her. You have another candidate, um, Adam Schliefer, who is uh, positioning himself as a progressive. He's able to self-fund his campaign because he's mm. the son of a pharmaceutical billionaire. So there's that guy. And then um, there is State Senator David Carlucci, who was part of that breakoff IDC group, basically yes. Democratic turncoats who allied with Republicans to block Democrats from having majority in the state Senate. So a lot of the energy what is around trying. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot going on in this yeah. primary, but um, Mondaire Jones has really distinguished himself as sort of the progressive Bernie-style candidate of choice. So um, a lot that progressives will be looking at It's going to be interesting. Exciting day. We're watching it. I get into this stuff. All right, our radars are next.